here in the perimeter, there are no stars. Out here, we is stoned, immaculate. Hello and welcome. This is David Eastall, The C86 Show. As you know, we love a special guest. This week, it's going to be the turn of Curved Air, the English progressive rock band formed in 1970 and are still going strong in 2021 with plans of a tour in 2022 and probably new material. Anyway, exciting stuff. But uh, this is the interview with Sonia Christina. Um, as we find out more about life, love, poetry and all that other groovy stuff. Anyway, it's going to be a great interview. So sit back, relax, enjoy. Take notes, I will test you at the end. But after several minutes of casual chat, we got down to that very exciting subject that was the early formative years in music or art, culture. Anyway, Sonia, it's over to you. Well, it would have been Dusty Springfield with um, Island of Dreams. Because um, when I, whenever that was, that came out uh, with the Springfields, it was the, the Springfields record, and um, <clears throat> I, and I saw her on television, or saw them on television. And I don't know. There was just something, so, you know. I re- I was really a drawn drawn to her, and then followed everything that she did um, up to a certain point. Um, was you know she was like and, and read all the interviews and 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 things so she was like my sort of rock beacon female yes. rock beacon at the time and then I fell in love with Adam Faith I think that was afterwards yes because uh, because he he did, you know what, what do you want and everything I remember my parents buying me the um the, the single for birthday or Christmas or something and and uh, you know me just being in this sort of orgasmic ecstasies listening to listening to this beautiful man singing who I'd kind of fallen in love with in the, in that sort of teen way that one does yes. fall for a, I know. fall for a musician we 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 all do that don't we really and were you and did you come from quite a, a musical house were they was there quite a sort of a musical vibe within within your sort of um Yes, house. Of course, there's. I can hear a, a clicking thing. Oh, it stopped now. Um, no, there was a dramatic. My my mother's mother was an, or her, it was. It turned out to be her adoptive mother, but we didn't know that until after my my mother died. But so I was brought up with the idea that my mother's mother was. Um, this famous actress who brought her up, you know, she was there from when she was a baby. And um, so the theatre and voice through through the theatre, my, my parents sent me to elocution lessons, which was in you know, lots of p- poetry speaking. So I started doing poetry competi- competitions and fell in love with seducing an audience with words, putting ideas into the silence yes. and um, and you know being nervous but enjoying the kind of the peace that comes once the nerve nerves still and one you know with you're focused on what you're saying and communicating and and so you know that that was sort of my introduction to performance and I used to do competitions with with poetry I think did I say that and um but I remember my 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 mother's mother <clears throat> when she was staying with us. She, uh, you know, I, I sang a bit. I'm pretty sure it was her. She said, "Oh, your voice is very breathy," you know. So um, she obviously thought there was work work to be done. <laughs> um, but I I just fell in love with with. Um, Acoustic, you know, the the sort of beatnik acoustic New York uh, thing was happening and finding its way to my my library record department. Yes, and you know, so I was able to borrow records there, sort of 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 people. And Buffy San Marie was was the next sort of person who really. First female, next female who who really got to my soul. Yeah, she's yeah. such a powerful performer. And had you sort of touched on that kind of other kind of world of 
the beatnik writers like people like um, Jack Kerouac and Allen Ginsberg and that kind of period of kind of literature that was that was happening in the late 50s early 60s where a lot of people obviously got quite excited by reading on the road and then sort of thinking god this is going to be it and then obviously you know 63 as Philip Larkin once said you know was the birth well he thought it was the start of the 60s with the first um Beatles album and also with the Lady Chatterley's Lover. Did you sort of fall into a bit of a that kind of interest in CND beat Nicky vibe? Um, yeah, I was very. Um, I, I I I don't remember what what I but what I'd heard, but I obviously I knew enough to kind of wanted to work to look, you know, to, to wear all denim and and be be like a like like be that was my idea of, of of being a beatnik was to wear denim and denim sneakers <laughs> and <laughs> jumpers and stuff but which which kind of translated to the to the kind of folk club image too yeah and i started performing in in folk clubs then and so i got into a lot of conversations and things with people there and i was sort of I'm, I'm not sure whether I actually got the bus there when I was like 13 because it, because it was quite a way from home. So I imagine my parents probably dropped me off and and picked me up or, or something even that uh, earlier on. I remember them doing that later on when I was 16. But anyway, so yeah, the, 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 I, I, knew, I, I knew about Jack Kerouac and the, um, you know, those those early early things and um what, what what was his name now the uh the i've got a book of his here i thought i was gonna see it and another another one of those writers and then so it's hard, hard to think back as it chron chronologically what happened but suddenly we all became interested in in the in the uh the beat poets whatever yeah. the uh ferengeti the, and the people like that Ferengeti. Yeah, yeah, and um, Ginsburg and and those sort of writers. Ginsburg, yeah, definitely Alan Ginsburg. We all wanted to be him, didn't we? Um, so yeah, but then did you start to get caught up? Because Bukowski, I was thinking of Bukowski. Oh, Charles uh, Bukowski. Yeah, the great kind of um, kind of slightly wild alcoholic writer. I remember reading the Post Office. I think that was one of his books. About it was all a bit grim, and then I watched the film Barfly. I thought, oh my god, that's quite grim, isn't it? That was an eighties film. Did you get slightly, you know, as the sixties progressed, you know, from that early, you know, like yeah, sixty three, and then sort of by sixty seven, it was the Summer of Love with, you know, in San Francisco they had the gathering of the tribes, you know, at Golden Gate Park, and then in the UK, in London, you know, like June July time they had this. 40 now Technicolor Dream at the Alley Pally with people like Pink Floyd and Arthur Brown and Yoko was there as well. Did did you sort of, because you were the perfect age for this, weren't you? did you get slightly sort of like, oh, this is very exciting? Or, or were you into that folk world of people like Al Stewart and Paul Simon and Bob Dylan who, who you know, when they were still quite acoustic? Well, I, um, I mean, all those people that you just mentioned, all those acoustic people, um, I actually um, got to know later on because when I was sixteen, I, 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 or fifteen, I um, went and 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 I introduced myself to Roy Guest, who was a the an agent for for acoustic musicians, including Buffy Samari and Al Stewart and John Cameron, who was Donovan's musical arranger, and. Um, and then he was he was a partner with Joy Joe Boyd, who and he managed the the other people like I think like Sandy Denny and and and, and so on. So um, those you know that that was I was out performing and and I got to to know these those those people really well and learned chords from from people in in dressing rooms and stuff. Mm. And I used and I took when well, I supported Sandy Denny at, at a couple of concerts, and I was really, really, you know, I, I she she was my my third female beacon beacon yes. because, oh. because she she was so powerful and direct and such a gorgeous voice and 
So, and like, like so, so, same with Buffy Saint Marie. She, Buffy Saint Marie, had was just, was just this beautiful little woman on on the stage strumming this guitar really really powerfully and and you know she was just filling the room with energy yeah. and 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 sandy did the same thing too and the the other i saw, I saw joan byers perform um at uh well, the royal albert hall or, or festival hall and everything and and peter paul and mary and and yes that you know that was all very lovely and and but but it didn't have the same kind of same kind of energy as 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 the people that I like because I think um, Dusty Springfield was also a powerhouse, wasn't she? Yeah, absolutely. And did other bands like the Incredible String Band or um, Comus? And then there was another prog rock band who started in Scotland. They, I think they called themselves One Two Three and then Clouds, and they only lasted for a few years before it all went south, as they as often these things do. So, did you kind of find that world especially incredible string band and the oh yeah I, I loved incredible string band a thousand whatever a thousand layers of the onion or whatever it was and october song i used to sing sing that and i think they were my favorites out of those people there was a lot of tom paxton songs around i met tom paxton at um trevor and sandy's place later on and um so there was Tom Tom Paxton. I, I I saw him perform. I liked his songs, but he's not somebody who survived with me. And you know, in 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 my in my sort of folk appreciation. Yeah. And but but in, the incredible string band was certainly very influential. I think on on my songwriting from yes. early on. Well, absolutely. And. and did- um, David Graham was 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 also a wonderful thing, and, and Bert Yanch, um, he he, I loved loved his work. But they 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 got to my 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 soul. Yes. Did you ever go to things like the David Bowie's Art Lab in in was it Beckenham? You know, because he was obviously at that stage in the seventies was was around on the sort of the acoustic kind of quite folk pop front wasn't he with you know songs like letter yeah. to Hermione and people working with Hermione obviously and John Cambridge did you did that sort of enter your sort of consciousness or, enter, or just your world no I didn't really fall I, f- I fell very heavily for David Bowie but not until 19 until until I heard Ziggy Stardust Yes. You know, that um, I heard. I heard uh, it was when Curved Air were off the road. We were between managements and between all sorts of things, and so I was listening to listening to stuff. And and uh, there were three. I heard um, Dark Side of the Moon and Ziggy Stardust and Mahavishnu, Birds of Fire, and they all are sort of seminal album, albums for me. So from that point on, I, I was I became a, a David Bowie devotee. You know, I think he's, you know, one of uh, he he's a genius. And then from then backwards, um, you know, sort of I, I started, Lou, Lou Reed and 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 the Velvet Underground and um, th- those people. In fact, like just the last couple of days, there's a really good um, pro. Um, documentary on the Velvet Underground on on Netflix, yeah. and I just watched that, and, I, and it, it's brilliant because it really captures that the the feeling of 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 the times and and of 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 Lou Reed and and John Cale and and things. Yes, in fact, I remember being at a dinner when with, with in New York with um, Stuart and John Cale was there. And I remember, I've, you know, it's, it's stamped in my heart. He said, you know, because, because I wasn't working, it was all the police was working and I, I was off the road at the time. And he said, you know, Sonia, you've got to get out there. The world is waiting for you. you know, so so that, 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 that I took as, 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 a, as advice from an angel. Absolutely. No, you, you have, to, have to do it, don't you, really? I mean, um, 
I was like, God, that was, yes, God, I just, I was just thinking that, because that's the Todd Haynes film that's come out, and I was just thinking also, I was the other night just talking about television programs, there's a classic album series, and there's one on Transformer, Lou Reed's, you know, Transformer, and that's kind of fascinating, yeah, because I couldn't, because it was funny, when they were talking to the musicians, who are all very English, and very sort of like, just like very unrock and roll who worked on that album and were doing the bass lines, you know, quite recently, I suppose, demonstrating what they were doing. And you just always had this thought in your mind that they were going to be some sort of, you know, slightly out of it rock and rollers. And they were just very sort of quite very together, you know, English musicians who just were very, you know, just guested and, and um, were session musicians who, who could just turn up, do the gig and go, right, that's great. Is it done? Fine, I'll go now. It's brilliant. It's really worth seeing. I was, because, because interestingly enough, in, in San Francisco area, we had like that, you know, because you mentioned Andy Warhol-ish and, and the factory, but in San Francisco, there was like, there was theatre companies like the Coquettes who were doing that kind of experimental drama stuff, which was all quite out there and far out. But you were in um, an early production of Hair in the 60s, weren't you? Which must have yeah, been... Yeah, in the first, the first, the first um, London cast of Hair, um, when it opened in, in London. And that, that, was, that was really exciting because I had been at college um, I'd come up to London and sort of because my my father wanted me to get, you know, something to fall back on as parents do, you know, some sort of qualification or, or something. Or, you know, I was busy doing all this music stuff. But um, he, I, 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 so I spent a year there, but I'd also been doing, going out and about doing official little concerts, which Roy, Roy Guest, booked for me and and also I was you know really into you know I'd made a lot of friends on the alternative scene in London you know people like the sort of the, the, the Pink Fairies and Mick Farron and the Deviants and you know the people from International Times you know they, they and because of a, a, an older girl at college who she was like I, th- I think she was the next next year up from me but even two years we, we became really really good friends and she introduced me to these people and 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 all that stuff so you know i was and as and as, as it happens mick farron and lived in a flat up above the the shaftesbury theater so but so uh, i've been at the college but then I ha- I'd been falling behind I'd been sort of falling asleep in college falling, as- falling asleep in lectures and so the the, the Klaus Newberg who the kindly um, principal he said he gave me a year off he said you know so that I could explore to see what I wanted to do and in that and, and in that year I went and auditioned and auditioned on they, they called us back loads and loads and loads of times about eight 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 recalls we had and then I got into hair Yes, and, and we knew it was important. You know, we just knew that it was groundbreaking stuff because theatre hadn't, you know, that sort of theatre hadn't hadn't happened before. It was it was all very new and and exciting to be part of. Yes, I guess at this stage you'd sort of learnt how to be a performer once, twice a night, or twice a day um, for a consistent run of you know production. So that kind of probably puts eight, you in a good eight state. shows a week. Eight shows a week, which obviously no, not eight, not eight, no, no, it's eight shows a week. But that that be right? Five, well, five, and the, the matinees. Yes, eight show, eight, eight shows a week for four, for two and a half years. Yes, that does. Um, that makes you work out whether you really want to continue or not. But at least it means <coughs> that you, you know what you're going to be doing every morning when you wake up or early afternoon. And then, as the sort of sixties progressed, and obviously you were that kind of amazing age where you'd probably be thinking, because I know. Because I've done a few interviews with Joe Boyd. Because there was that brilliant um, exhibition at the V&A, wasn't there? So you want a revolution, and and there was Barry Miles there, and and you know he was all part of that kind of world of IT, International Times, and Joe Boyd and various yeah. other people. Did you feel there was kind of a cultural and social revolution? I mean, you've been in here as well, and just seeing that everything had become so. From I know it's a bit of a cliche about the black and white to suddenly moving into this Technicolor with, you know, the psychedelic movement, and then you know, the Summer of Love, you know, with Monterey and then, you know, the Beatles albums. And then by the late 70s, not the late 70s, the late 60s, very early 70s, you know, Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin all pass away, you know, Altamont happens, 
Charles Manson, the whole, the party suddenly becomes a little bit kind of like, you know, messy, doesn't it, to put it kindly. I just wonder what it was like for you to, in that very intense time, you know, dealing with, with so much going on, or was hair kind of just keeping you quite grounded at that stage? Well, I don't know. The hair was, was, I was, was a, I was learning a lot from, from, you know, about performance. You know, I, I, I was guessing gaining a perform, performance experience, you know, and, and the, the way that we were, we were trained was also very novel. It was very much like Est, you know, so you, you stand your ground and you exude your energy and, and you, you fill as big a space as possible on stage and, and, and you trust all your fellow performers and, and it was wonderful. But um, as far as the hippie thing was concerned, I'd, I'd become a hippie when I was about, when I was about 15, 16 and, and got, had my bell around my neck and I was wearing, had, had went, I had bare, went around with, with bare feet and when I was at college, I was going around London with barefoot the, the whole time, and I had my shaggy coat and Afghan. whatever, yeah, my Afghan coat. And um, so I, I, I really identified with the hip, the, that you know that that something there, about, you know, with the, the hippie thing. And I was listening. There was a little record shop on my way up to college, and he used to tell me what what music I should buy, the new stuff that come in from America and things, you know, sing, things like Tim Buckley and, and whatever the, the, probably the, the doors and they, the, well, the new, new incredible string band things as, as, as they went on and, and um, the traffic, I like traffic then was listening to that, but meeting Farron and, and um, the Pink Fairies and things, this, this was a different, this wasn't the uh, the Beatles kind of Joni Mitchell summer of love. This was this was the other side. This was the precursor of punk. This is they you know they they. It's interesting. Did, have you seen that the the documentary on Netflix about about the Velvet Underground? No, it's on those things to do this Christmas alongside. Eight hours of the Beatles, let it be. But that's another, you know, that's a day, day yeah. of our lives. But no, I do. Um, I've got the feeling that that I mean, well, well, they said that these New York kids, you know, with that in that that time frame, that the Velvet Underground were very, very cool. Um, even though they didn't reach the huge amount of success at that time that Lou Reed wanted to achieve, you know, there was a real kind of you know they re they they really sneered at you know the hippies you know so why how you know what what good is giving a flower to somebody to somebody who hates you I and mean, what what what's that going to do you know you've got to you've got to you know you have, you have to rise up you know that I forget what, what the word the word that the uh, that the it was I I think it was the the drummer from the the girl drummer from 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 the from the uh from the the Velvet Underground, but you know, so so this was the sort of edge which led then led to the New York doll, Dolls and the MC Five, and they were the they were they were McFarren's influences, which then led to Lemmy and Hawkwind and and the Pink Fairies and stuff. And so I I, I you know these were my male heroes. You know the uh, I did see a saw Incredible String Band on my first trip. Well, actually, literally, my, my first trip and uh, my first visit to to the Middle Earth, and, right? You know, and and I was kind of, you know, I actually got to talk to Robert Williamson, who's who's remained a hero of mine. I've 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 been to see I've seen him play perform a couple of times over the decades, and uh, I think he's absolutely wonderful. I love the what he does with the he, he, he does things with a melody that no other person does you know he really communicates and he he's, his music comes from somewhere very different than than your average pop popular music or folk music or, or anything it's just so so amazing but anyway so that that that's one side so now I was immersed in this very masculine um rebellious 
um, rock, real rock, rock music without poetry. <laughs> um, it was, it was, but but there were all these, you know, incredible. Uh, the um, International Times had very good writing and you know they had these sort of comic strips that you know were very irreverent and then there was a friends magazine and Gandalf's Garden and you know these were all sort of part of the landscape you know the the uh, Gandalf's Garden would have be more poetic and things but it was a different thing it was much more whatever writing was in in those magazines was was much more political and more what we associate with the the change in cultures, yes. you know, the, the not it wasn't just flower power. And the same thing in in hair, we were um, we were taught how to be on stage and and how to channel the sort of hippie energy by the two people who wrote hair and the people who who directed and choreographed the American shows before 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 then, and. Um, I remember going to, more recently going to see a rerun of Hair and, and it was just ridiculous. So the rest of us from, we had a little, little group of, of the old Hair cast going to see it and they were just kind of floating around and, and moving so in slow motion. And we, we were just, you know, thinking how wrong that was because when we were, when we were in our production, it was all about high energy. It was like we were all speed freaks, you know, and super stoned and, you know, and kind of junkies and everything, you know, we, we were everything that we wasn't just about. I mean, that 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 production was just about like what, the thing that irritated the New Yorkers, New Yorkers, you know. Yes. Uh, it's beautiful. Have a flower, you know. I mean, even LSD wasn't like that, you know. <laughs> it went in and went in and out of all different kinds of of energies and 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 states. You know? Yes, well, absolutely. I mean, it's kind of interesting you mentioned about that kind of the New York scene and the punk scene because um, in Detroit we had you know Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and that also had played a major part, which was going to be the birth of punk alongside people like MC Five with. Um, Wayne Kramer and his gang and the, yeah. and, and the White Panthers and John Sinclair. And obviously, you know, there was kind of, you know, the, the East Coast definitely had that image of being sort of dressing in black. But also there was kind of, the drugs were quite different in New York and especially during that early 70s and into the, you know, CBGB's punk period. I mean, New York was kind of almost it was bankrupt. So, you know, it was kind of really cheap, you know, so people could go and live there, but, you know, you'd have to live there with lots of criminals and junkies and the mafia, which was quite hard going as well. So it, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, a fascinating time. And Mick Farron as, as well, as well documented when he goes to Isle of Wight, he, he's kind of protesting because he can see the commercialization of what is going to be the sort of what was originally was quite an idyllic, you know, kind of, mindset and a, and a sort of new future and he could see people just looking at it as a way to make loads of money and obviously he wanted to kind of put his you know his all he boot in really didn't he dear old Mick Farron he wasn't he wasn't slow in coming forward at all really and Lemmy was amazing because he'd been in the Rock and Villa Vickers and then he got his gig with the Hawkwind and he was you know and they were all part of that kind of London North London mostly squat yeah. scene wasn't there so there was an awful yeah, Labrick, Labrick Grove Yes, with dear old Dave Brock and and such like. So the punk thing kind of did <clears throat> kind of start to sort of bubble away, and then you had bands like um, I suppose it was Doctor Feelgood really, and then sort of the Doctors of Madness with Richard Strange. But you but you were already kind of you'd already formed your band by then, hadn't you? Yeah, well, the, I it, it it I joined it the. Um after doing a hair I mean when he was talking about New York hair was set in New York so hair was of you know very much about the New York scene not the west coast scene you know it was it it was a had a had a new New York vibe um, I imagine but and also another another thought on hair um for the on the 40th anniversary I think it was of of um the opening of hair of the very very first hair cast in America I went to a uh, a 
sort of reunion, uh, um, a festival in Golden Gate Park, which, which you know, that and that was very magical for me to, to actually be in Golden Gate Park, the sort of mythical, and to be in, in San Francisco. And, and we, the, we were various people from various hair, hair casts all over America. And we made up a little tribe to go on and we went on just after some Native American um, first dawn, dawn celebration thing, ritual, dawn ritual. And, and then we went and did hair and Aquarius and, and, and things. And, then, and it was really, really, you know, there was, there was, I just realized then that hair had its own sound. Sort of the people who'd been in hair, they, they sang a certain way and also with 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 new productions of hair they never get that right all the kids who are in in hair now they've all listened to youtube and they've all they've they've heard many many different they've been influenced by many different kinds of voices and things whereas we were all fairly natural singers you know and so all the these singers in hair were you know they all had that particular kind of hair hair sincerity i guess that that was the feeling that was there in the voice it was it was to do with the feeling and the communication rather than singing well you know it yeah. was it, it was it was it was cool i know so um where was i what, what was i what was what, what was i on the way to when i got there that's a good point oh, curved air curved, curved air. air yeah <laughs> when i'd been in hair a while um well, like two and a half years, I, my Roy Guest called, called, called me and said on the first, it was the first of January, 1970, he said, you know, I've, this, the manager of a, of a, of a new band would like you to audition for, 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 for them. He thinks you'd be good for, for, for them. So I went down and I, and I auditioned and I played Melinda more or less, which is a, a, a song curved, a song which I wrote actually when I was, before before hair when I, when I was you know f free, free f when I was f footloose and fancy free all all around Labrook Grove and everywhere else in in London so I sang them Melinda and and they which just showed them how I sang and everything and I listened to their music and and I thought it was it was beautiful it was really really beautiful music it wasn't sort of you know completely incomprehensibly classical it was a lovely mix of rock and lovely sort of mel classical melodies yes so uh, so i took my hair energy um and learned how to perform with the these songs and i wrote wrote most of the lyrics for 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 the for the early songs and um and i brought my sort of hippie whatever my alternative it's not really really hippie it was whatever sort of alternative well i suppose if hippie co co covers all of it if hippie if you think of pink pink floyd not not pink floyd pink fairies as as hippie do you think of pink fairies no, as hippies not really no I'm slightly anarcho punks no and no they're not anarcho punks more of a late early 80s i suppose they were sort of more anarchists weren't they you couldn't mix yeah anarchists well, you couldn't you couldn't so really it's that yeah, he's not cuddly, is he? You wouldn't want to, you know. I mean, no, no, no. He was. Like, he 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 had the. You know, he when I when I went up to his flat in between, sort of, um, you know, in, in the intervals and stuff in in or the 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 break between performances, I used to hang out up there, and there were the Hell's Angels and poets <laughs> and 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 Caroline Coon, who oh, was yes. who was a you know all these people up there. So so. You know, they, they. It's interesting because he often I, he's often quite sniffy about Carol. I remember him saying, "Oh, Caroline Kuhn." He, he he's quite dismissive of her actually in some of the kind of comments and interviews I've heard him. As if or was it was it Jermaine Greer? Maybe I put it wrong. Maybe oh, it, was it could be because I think he I think referred it was. to her as Lady Bountiful, just being you know quite idealistic. I mean, Jermaine Greer is definitely a bit more hardcore, isn't she? I yeah, mean, I think it was. Last time you met Lemmy Kilmeister, was that during? Um, the yeah, he's he he was. He, I consider him a mate because um, you know I I you know we had several conversations. Like, you know we, we we in passing in over the decades. And I remember him coming 
um, I don't remember the first time I met him. It was probably to do, to do with the when Hawkwind, the Hawkwind show or, or something, because um, the Paul Rudolph, I'm still in touch with, um, and he he was I think he, I think he was was he in Hawkwind with at the same time as Lemmy because I was a good friend of uh, uh, I am a good friend of of, of Paul's right um, but I remember going to when I was sort of with Stuart and I was just beginning to start writing songs and and again and and performing and and I, I performed down at Ding Dingwalls and Lemmy was there and you know and. Uh, I, I, he he was saying that that he he said that my songs you know, I should just stick to the harder red harder edge songs rather than mix it up with fluffy stuff you know whatever I can't remember how he 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 ex and and Stuart was saying you know there you know you've got all this you know you've we've we've got, you've got every, everything that we've got mean me, meaning me and Stuart yet you're talking about being stoned and broke you know they have been like sort of channeling punk things and. And uh, so, you know, it, it was, I couldn't please the man, but it it was, uh, <laughs> that, that that was probably the last time I, I saw Lemmy. Lemmy was, that was down, it was in the 80s. Right. God, what a, what a legend, really. Um, so, yeah, so then you, you sort of, because the band were already, had already been a band, even though they were called something different by, before you joined them. So I just wondered what that was like joining quite a not really established band, but some some people who had already kind of been working together before the the last piece of the jigsaw fitted in. Well, they weren't entirely sure. We went off to the countryside to finish off the songs at the bass player's sort of country house in 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 uh, in Dorset or somewhere somewhere, and. Um, they weren't. I remember they they weren't sure that they needed a girl singer. So I remember going off, being sent off back to the house and listening to them taking turns singing the songs. And then they came back and said, oh, "Well, actually, we can't sing these songs, so so we do need you." You know. So so then I you know just started writing, writing, finishing off the songs that they had like sort of the first line for and and, and things. And we got on really well because I also wanted to bring some of the hair ethos into my any of my relationships I think is 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 just to be very natural and and you know not afraid of 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 um physical contact with 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 other people you know with with men or whatever because people often ask me you know so what was you know what was it like being a female and in, in this misogynist rock industry and I said well I never I never experienced that because I think well, I went from hair to curved hair, and then I, you know, and then I very quickly established a, you know, a very good, um, very good uh, communication with, with all of them, you know, that that we we could touch each other, we could cuddle, we could chat about anything, we could, you know, that we could be quite raunchy and naughty and and everything, without falling in love with each other. In fact, I did, I did, I fancied the original bass player at the time but but it wasn't didn't sort of lead to you know we, we, we didn't pair off or anything it, but but I mean I remember he was he was if, if anybody he was the most most um attractive to me but the, you know it was it was just I, I think and then when we were on the road I, I was surrounded by my gang you know so I I wasn't I was safe from anybody who might try to misogynize me you know it's kind of it's not it it wasn't something that um came into my compass if, if you wanted to sleep with somebody and it was mutual you 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 you, you slept with them it was free love after all yes absolutely i know i did an interview with well done a couple with dana gillespie and um it all sounded very relaxed you know she was just talking about you know sometimes you just went to bed with Mick Bronson because you just happened to be not doing much that evening and then went, well, that was no yeah. big. <laughs> and it was like, oh, that was good. So, um, yes, it was like, well, it was it, it, it was of its time when you're at a certain age and there was no kind of hang-ups. You just kind of just enjoyed it and just moved on the next day and um, didn't think about it really. And 
Yes, it was fine. It was all good in the 70s. Yeah, so, so, but then, you know, the band, I mean, because I've done, been doing this show for quite a while, and it's kind of interesting, and, and this is probably a lot more with the 80s bands, but it probably works in the 70s, but, you know, most bands, they get together, they have, you know, the 12-month, you know, practice and rehearsing, and then seeing if it's going to go anywhere, and they get a single together, John Peel would play it, and it's like, yeah, great, and the John Peel session would happen, and then the first album, and then there would be the tour around the country, you know, in their little transit van, and the then the second album and that was often a little bit tricky and then the third and and during that there's often a five-year narrative where you know it's like 24 7 the band and then it just gets to that point where it's like this is getting quite hard and and we need to have band therapy as we I, I just remember hearing this kind of by it was Stuart Copeland it was one of those documentaries on the police and he was talking about reunions and he was getting back together with the the police and it was obviously him and Sting, he said everyone was having a great time. There was also millions of pounds worth in, uh, invested in this reunion. And so everyone was like, come on, please get on. And it was like, but there were two people not having a great time, him and Sting, and they had to have band therapy and, and they kind of worked it out and continued the tour. And everyone went, oh, that's great. My pension sorted for the rest of my life. So it was interesting, isn't it? Band therapy. Um, yeah, dear old Stuart. So, yeah, so... But you sounded like your dynamic with the band was really quite healthy. It was probably, you know, it went from, you know, you quickly kind of went from the first album, Air Conditioning, to 71, you know, and, and the sound was developing and you were getting kind of much more confident. Um, no, we, 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 uh, we hit the, uh, it, uh, the five-year marker. It's very much like a, a marriage or a, a, a love, a love relationship is that you know you you fall, you fall in love you bond you do things together and then you know and then you start um finding fault with each other towards the end of five years which which is when you have to kind of you either split up or you find a different way to 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 relate to each other to different ways to be in love that's when you discover you know deeper love my friends who have survived you know gone from 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 the beginning and and ended up together that they do have this kind of much deeper understanding of each other and and things than than the kind of falling in love kind of attraction and sex and and babies and things like that and then what you know it's kind of that that's the pattern for so many people and with with bands um for, for us the f f first album um for me was the best because we we'd been when i joined joined the band we finished off went down to, went to the country wrote all the songs then then we went on we the band had a were, were being backed by um they were had an, a, by an advance from ireland music publishing and so we um you know we went straight on tour we were touring all over the place everywhere and then then we recorded the album before the end of 1970 and um and and that and it was a and it was a and it was successful, but also, but also the the shows were really successful wherever we played. If little, I and mean, we we toured Europe, um, with sort of Holland and Germany, and and um, a couple of gigs in France, and um, it was all you know the the people really the the audiences really really got what we were doing, and and we and the press picked up on what was happening. And um, so we got we we they, they were got write ups in the NME and and all the the music papers and things. Which and, and John Peel loved you as well, didn't he? I mean, he was. Oh yes, yes, and that that probably was our first break. You know, he because he's he's not, you know, he he picks up on the essence of who you who you are. If he likes you, he likes you for who, for who you are, not not because of of anything commercial. It's just you know you're doing something that is important yeah so uh, and then we, we did lots of shows at the roundhouse which was also an iconic place and and i had been to shows at the at the roundhouse when i was a, a when i was a a um a young when, when, when i went in between sort of college and 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 hair a little bit i, I saw them the doors, the show with the doors and the Jefferson Airplane, and that was fantastic. But I, you know, we used to go there quite often. My God, being, you saw the famous concert with Jim Morrison sort of doing his thing. 
which is kind of the yeah film. yeah god that yeah that must have been amazing it was it was i mean i was i was probably really stoned and 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 the roundhouse being round you one doesn't sort of go right to the front of the stage necessarily you, you, you kind of wandered around and this this music washed over you and things and I've I've appreciated it more by watching videos you know to actually seeing what what he was actually doing but <laughs> you know I did I did like love the the doors you know the, the then and and more than the Jefferson airplane I don't never really and I wasn't really a big fan of the Jefferson airplane I preferred music to the band like Love, Love Arthur Lee's Love. Yes. That album I really really liked. Yes. And and and, yeah. and, and it was interesting because because as as the seventies progressed, I mean politically it was quite interesting in this country. Also, you toured a, you did several big American well, big you know, you did several American tours during that time as well, didn't you, in the early seventies? And built up a cult following. Was that because that's often one of the things that um, a lot of parents often say we went to America and came back and broke up because they just kind of hated the experience. They thought they were going to have a great time. But how well, did that's you... exactly what happened, yeah. Oh, did it? <laughs> wow, what a guess. Anyway, yes. Well, what was, because mostly it's like, God, it just finished us off. We just couldn't cope. We were just gibberish wrecks when we came back, um, which often when I meant to do interviews with Americans, I mentioned that and they always laugh going, yeah, it's really hard work, isn't it? You don't realise. Because in the UK, it's so tiny. You just kind of, can putter around from one city to the other and think, oh my God, that was a three hour drive. Whereas like in America, it's like, oh my God, I'm not sure if I can go. Yeah, I've, I've, I've just been um, sort of, I'm looking at some of my my uh, my kind of uh, memorabilia because somebody wants it for a char- charity auction. I just found a, there was this postcard that I wrote to my parents it was in, in, in my collection and it just says, oh, blah, blah, blah. And it says, um, uh, so we've been here. We've been here. Um, just posted this before I leave. Leave New Orleans. We've been here long enough now. Um, there's a hope to spend at least a week at home before rehearsing the British tour. We're we're it's we're working so hard and it's going well. So many miles. So many aeroplanes. <laughs> So many miles, yes, yeah, so much waiting around, isn't it, really? Because by 72, 73, the band splits, and then do you take the baton and say, right, this is it, we're going to continue for a, at least a bit longer? I can't, I'm not stopping now, this is not, this is not in the, this isn't in the story. No, I, I wasn't, wasn't, I wouldn't have been wanted to stop anyway, but our management at the time said, you know, it's better to carry on, whatever you're going to do, do it with the curved their name because you know that that that's that's you've got the mileage there you know you've already got the the it, it'll it makes more business sense i guess yeah and so me, me and and the bass player um the the uh mike michael wedgwood we we auditioned um these people and we included eddie jo- well eddie jobson that was a very seamless transition because Eddie Jobson's band had supported Curved Air at, in Newcastle. And of all the places, that's because that's where Sting came from too. And but he he um we he was he, he could all he already already knew Curved Air's material. We knew that. He was really young, so he was 16, 17, and he um so we contacted him. To come down and and he agreed to play with us, which was good because that sort of gave a continuity. If we, we could we could then play well, the curved air repertoire because we had somebody who you know played keyboards and violin and could do it with authenticity, which is important. With all the lineups of curved air, the most important thing is has has had to be that it sounds like it's been played for the first time and that it is authentic. You know mm. that it's it, and that it may be you know it maybe goes to new places because it has an air of freedom about it. So that's what I was looking for with the band members and Kirby, who's who's still who's you know who comes and goes. He's with us at the moment, um, and he was just the most amazing guitar player. I mean, Francis, he had that kind of edge that Francis had, 
but he was wild. You know, he had a has a much more sort of rocky, bluesy sensibility, and and you know played. He he was more like the you know the 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 uh, Pink Fairies type type vibe. You know, he was kind of so because I, I sort of wanted to take the band in a more rocky. Rocky, rocky direction, you know. So that because that rather than be have to have have too much kind of melodic, classically classical stuff, and so it was really just um, metamorphosis. Our big long song that that Eddie wrote. I mean, that was our our only <clears throat> that and the and the violin instrumental. They were both kind of you know one opus and one violin. Sort of peace and that kind of would satisfy satisfy the ardent curved dairy people, yes. and then a little bit of explorations, sort of a song a song or two from from the other people in the band, and and that then so that and and at the time um, we went down really really well live. We went went to Italy and we played and stuff, and um, um, the, the, the but the um, record company didn't get behind it and so it didn't um you know it didn't really do much in terms of sales at the time but over the years it's now one of the most popular of that and it's, well all, all the different albums they have their people are there are some 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 of the fans favorite favorite albums and um it's it's air cut is one of the you know it's it's, it's, it's very very popular yes because, I mean, it's kind of, I mean, I know I was a massive Smiths fan in the 80s and um, they, they kind of, they have a lot of issues. They never get a proper manager and they never quite get all that world sorted out. And then it all just kind of ends in 87 in a really messy way. And then they end up all going to court and things get more messy. So that's kind of the, the nature of the band. Did were, Curved Air sort of had a lot of kind of members coming, going, stopping, restarting. I mean, look, you know, when you look at that, did, did uh, do you sort of think, God, that was that could have been so much easier if we'd sort of slightly had better advice management or just managed to get on, you know, with each other a bit more smoothly? Well, the first break was one because they hated lots of touring. You know, the 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 American experience had had worn our sensitive main composers to a frazzle. You know, they they were literally gibbering wrecks. So and 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 before that, on the second and third album, they had done. Um, they had written. They couldn't. They couldn't. They didn't hear music or sound. You know the the production. They they each produced their own. They wrote. They wrote, wrote the songs. And for, for they they each wrote the songs for the diff, for, for the different side. I can't can't say that you know they they wrote this they they just took charge of one side that Daryl wrote the for first side and Francis wrote the other side to blame two sides for an LP and um you know and and they and they were in the control room seeing um taking charge of how it sounded because they they didn't hear things the same they didn't, couldn't write together anymore yeah. even by the second album they came up with their own things sort of separately. They played together well on stage because there was quite a lot of improvisation and and um, things that that songs where where the band had to play play um, play together, and that was all fine. But it was in terms of the sort of the 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 sort of direction, and and so by the after the third album after Phantasmagoria. You know, Daryl wanted to could do his own thing. He didn't want to be held back by back by having to to um, to collaborate with somebody else. So and and Francis too. He he just had his, his Francis was beginning to get you know very very suspicious of the music industry. <clears throat> but he um, he he. He had so he he did sort of take another dip and he joined Sky, and 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 he wrote lots of lots of library music and and things and then he did some, his own albums afterwards. But he never really wanted after Sky. <coughs> excuse me, 
he never wanted to be in a a band a band again and when we tried to get to get together again in 2009 2008 you know he was definitely not wanting he didn't he never wanted to play those songs again he didn't want to play the old songs which is what the fans want to come hear you know yes he might he was into jam just francis was t- at that stage in 2008 by by all the years that had gone by francis was j- only into jamming you know the only music he would play would be sort of music that would be completely free form and daryl was into making world crafted songs and with his own production and you know with him in charge and so when we we tried to do it with everybody all together and then eventually i said to daryl you know Fr- francis said he he wasn't in, he he couldn't do it he didn't want to do it with daryl he couldn't work with daryl still couldn't work with daryl so i said to daryl right you take charge then daryl you know if you're the balls in your court so he he we all kind of we the the idea was to sort of re-record the um, original songs but have them produced in the way that Daryl thought they should have been in the first place you know yes which is it was you know that was his opinion so we we put that together and, and it was a good way of kind of getting to know the songs again and to performing them and finding out how for, for me you know how I wanted to perform these songs now yeah so th- that happened and then we went back on the road then but for the years in between the air cuts came we did with, with the air cut band we toured we did well but the reviews weren't that great and um but they but they both immediately got new opportunities I mean Eddie was picked up by Roxy Music and and Kirby thought well he might as well carry on with his you know with stretch with his 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 with Elma Gantry and so they flew away and that which left me broke and working at the Playboy for a living yes. and um and it's just because I had a, I had a child who, who'd been born just a, in the middle of hair and um <clears throat> so I, I mean I had to earn money to to support him so yeah. um so that was a, and, and then um, Miles Copeland and Daryl teamed up, and and Miles sort of said, "What well, to Daryl? We'll get Curved Air back together again because we we Curved Air had debts, and so we did got we the we got the original band to back together again, then to to play all the old songs." And, um, but it was a very short tour. It was, I'm like, you know, it was sort of, it was such an important time, but it was only eight weeks, I think. But we, it was the time when one could do great gigs in universities, you know, with a really vibrant audience, which was, yes. I wish, wish that happened now because that was, you know, with this social secretary and, you know, there's some really, really good bands, you know, were able to play to a young and impressionable and enthusiastic, you know, and discriminate, discriminatory audience, you know, it, it was, it was, um, so most of, most of those gigs were done, they were either done in at big venues or in universities, so, and it was a lot of gigs, so that was fantastic, but then after that, the others drifted away again, Daryl, Daryl, Daryl has started working with Miles's brother, which is Stuart Copeland, and he, he would they were they were sort of and and then there was Mick Jakes was in in that band so he he said he he tried to talk me into sort of carrying on with Curved Air and I was saying no 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 but then Stuart and I became were an item we'd become a sort of an item before when our eyes first met across the rehearsal room floor when, when they were rehearsing for the live show and so since we were an item I thought well okay let's go oh let's let we'll do curved air but i my relationship I, I was in a real mess emotionally at that time and i didn't want to write songs i didn't want to do all the any of that stuff you know but we got together and 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 so then that was the the kind of the last two albums of of, of curved air and i actually now for the people who who are interested um i've started a, a um patreon thing yes for for the future of curved air we have a brilliant brilliant lineup um 
who who um, have been you know we have lots of fans for this with these players and um, with our pa- patrons the patrons that we have so far I've been having listening sessions on a on a on a, a platform called Discord which is connected to Patreon and we and we it doesn't have a, a facility to be able to stream the music but every, every week i've been doing a different on a wednesday night i've been doing um a, a listening session for a curved air album which is really good so i'm i'm there and then they kind of they come into this music room and then they play the album on their own on their own sort of hi fi's or whatever they call them these days yes. and I, and i've and i've started playing it on mine so i'm there you know in the, in the the world of that album and so i you know they ask me questions about the about that time and and we talk and i sort of get to know get to know them so anybody who wants to join patreon.com patreon.com and pa- pa- patreon.com forward slash curved air one word excellent God, that's you know that that will help keep us on the road because because you know the in these these are difficult times i know they're difficult for for everybody but we do need money to pay for rehearsal rooms our violinist lives in poland and so when he needs to come over for for rehearsals our money we we lost a lot of money on not being able to do um gigs in brazil that we were supposed to do that we were due, due to do in 2020 and um you know so we, we lost money not being able to do shows and um so we we have nothing in our in our kitty to keep us going yes. and we so so this is why the patreon um ideal um is or patreon what, what the ethos is that was a good a good word for it the the that the the thing the the crowdfunding thing it's so basically it's it's a sort of it's a membership thing where people can pay for we've got four four levels we can we might change that around at any time but the the starting level is one pound a month and then we've got three pounds a month and then nine pounds a month and then 25 pounds a month and we've got people people at on it at every level yeah but the one pound a month i think makes it makes it easier i mean if, 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 if everybody who was my facebook friend and curved air's friend and um were was was to 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 join at the one pound level even i mean more is great but if they all were to, were to support the band at one pound a month all the people who who were interested enough to be to follow us on facebook you know we would be fine yes you know, it's Love. nice to have the 25 pounds but you know it, it's two that's great but we we don't and we don't don't anticipate that we just want to keep going well, absolutely. No, I've got I've come across quite a few artists who've who've done the Patreon kind of model, and it's kind of you know they they you know it's good for it builds the you know a certain you know fan base or friend base, and it also keeps the band relevant. But also it keeps the artists who I spoke to thinking, oh God, I've got a I don't know if it's like two songs a month they've got to sort of produce for this kind of membership and part of the deal. But it keeps so it keeps that kind of certain urgency thing oh my god I still need to write my two songs and put that out otherwise I'll break my promise so you know and it, it keeps a certain relationship and a relevance going and um yes and hopefully next year might might make things even a little bit easier with touring so did you I mean working with Stuart which you did for a few years and was Miles your manager at that stage as well for the last couple of years before he yes before he worked on to the went on to the police because yeah he he just brought his book out because I interviewed him a few months ago so because he started with Wishbone Ash when he was about 16 or 17 didn't he and then he sort of found himself suddenly being he had a pun, much more part of the punk scene in the sort of 70s yeah I mean that he was what once um the punk punk began he got he was seduced by that and that you know he saw that as the future having sort of managed renaissance and and um wishbone ash and and various ver- various people mm-hmm. various bonzo dog doodah band i think did he did he manage them as i'm not, I'm well, not I know, sure I, know, I mean he's got a classic story where he was going to be, put a tour on and it was going to have lou reed 
And when he phones up to ask where Lou was, the guy says he's on, you know, he's in the bathroom and he says, well, that's fine. I'll wait. And the guy he says he's been there for three days and the tour doesn't really happen. I don't, Lou never appears and he loses lots yeah, of that, money. Uh, yes, that was, I think, I think I remembered that what was it that there, there was a, a big tour. I can't remember what it's called now, um, but it had, um, had, had a, a sort of a, a classic name. Do you know what the tour was called? No, but I, I can't. I'd have to have a look at his book. But it was kind of one of those quite amusing stories where, you know, obviously Lou, Lou wasn't in a good space at that stage and had spent a long time in the yeah. toilet and not, not coming out. So when, you know, when the band finished in 76, just, just an idea, do you then just think that's it and get on with the rest of your life? Or do you still sort of... Oh. Yeah, we we were we were in love with punk. Uh, um, Stuart and I were living in, um, which was it was it wasn't a a sort of a squat like um, you know a a communal type squat you know of an of an empty house whatever. It was a a a it was a flat that there was a dispute from with the um, between the people who were there. And the um, the person who was one, one person was responsible for paying the rent, rent, and somebody else who was living there wouldn't pay the rent. And so um, we were brought in by Miles Senior, by Stuart's and Miles's brother, no, dad, father, FBI, father, Mr. FBI. You know the the the, the anarchic super the super anarchist um, to. Um, to to remove this said tenant who was wasn't going to move and this um person is now very well known i mean it's lady georgia campbell (laughs) now she's an expert on the um she writes about the 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 royal family and and things and uh she is a trans transsexual so and when we got there the only sign of her of her being there was her suitcase in the room which then became which became the uh, the police's um rehearsal room eventually but um there, this war was going on between Marsha and Georgia and Georgia was was definitely I mean they the boys tried their best to really gross out Georgia and and be as horrible as possible. It threw all her clothes out the window and and had a had a picked up in the street and she just come came straight back in and and she was you know she, I was nice to her but because that's not not my 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 kind of way of doing things. But Ian Stewart's Ian Copeland Stewart's other brother, the agent and Stewart, they did their best, but 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 Georgia wasn't wasn't didn't bat an eyelid and she used to have dinner parties in the in the living room and and things and then but mostly she never slept there just her, just her suitcase was there and um and eventually she won the the court case and and and, and I remember her sitting by the fire in her in her room the where the, the room of the suitcase rubbing her hands together and tearing up papers saying she'll be in it for thousands she'll be in it for thousands which really was Cruella de Vil, you know she had you know, long blonde hair and 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 you know sort of very sort of strong features Blimey. you know and tall you know god I know that's the joy of life isn't it we've all lived with a few odd people in our times, haven't we? Shared 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 houses with people that you just think, they're a bit bit strange, aren't they? I'm a bit scared. I might lock my door at night and um things So like anyway, but, 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 but I remembered the thread of what we were saying. On so we Stuart and I had been going down to the Roxy Club, which was just a stroll away from Mayfair where we were. Oh living. right. So you were there, you were there doing your punk thing. We, yeah, we yeah, we we were just watching, yeah. There's Mark Mark P. The spitting spitting glue, and there was X Ray Specs and and Billy Billy Idol and the Generation X. They were, and um, and these people they were all very. You know, Stuart and I used to go down every week. You know, we we thought this was fantastic. You know, was they were there again. It, it was like my my thing about energy. They were t- these bands came on, and they just. Pfft, put so much energy into, into their 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 performance you know their 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 
the singers, the, the, the musicians, and it, it was very, very simple, but it was like a wall of sound with, with a roar of, of vocals over the top and all in their different ways, apart from the jam, who were very sedate, but they were down there too with their, yes. with the, with, the, with their manager, father, manager person. And they all, they, they all wore, wore Beatles suits or whatever, Beatles outfits, but, fun. um, but if they came from a different place, but they were part of the scene. So in, in our Mayfair apartment, the, uh, the police was rehearsing and, um, and on the New Year's Eve into 1977, we had, a, we had a party, a New Year's Eve party, which included you know, members of the dam, members of the Six Pistols, and, and, and we were playing punk music and we had some of our old, you know, just hippie, hippie friends who thought, oh, gosh, God, what the terrible music, whatever, you know, all the real musos. Didn't, couldn't couldn't understand what we saw in it but we say no it's great it's great so Stuart formed the police and I formed eventually I, I, I auditioned um, producers and I settled settled on 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 um, on Roy, uh, Thomas Baker Roy Thomas Baker isn't it Roy Thomas Baker well, the, the the Queen producer. I mean, the, the Bob Harris came and auditioned to be to, to produce my album, and and then Roy Roy Baker did. He he he. I went up to him and asked him to if he would produce my album, and so he he said that he would. But then he he tried to sell it to his record company, and then they were they weren't weren't and they weren't so into it. We did a couple of demos and stuff, and so the actual album didn't come out till much later. But I did my, I got a band together called Sonia Christina's Escape, which symbolized my kind of escape from, from, from the sort of, the it was, it was my sort of punk statement, I guess. I'd cut my hair and, and um, Strip was doing, doing his thing. And so we, we toured around and we did one gig at the Music Machine, as it was then. And um, when, when, you know, a lot of the sort of punk, the punk um, royalties and and other people's royalties were 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 there watching the show and 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 it went 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 well but you know we just we went, we went around and then you know we then Stuart um, eventually he he moved to the country and he he wanted to move to the country because where we were living in town there was there were a lot of people, fans coming to the door and things like that. And anyway, he just wanted to make a nest in the country. So, um, so that's what happened. You know, we, 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 I, I had my sort of punk explosion. Stuart had his punk explosion and that evolved into sort of motherhood for me afterwards and with a, and then a gradual re reappearance in, in, in music, which then end, ended up with the reunion of Curve Dare in 2008. Yes, um, and we did. We did. We did. We did. We, did uh, we had. We had a reunion in two thousand in 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 nineteen ninety as well. Which, but that was just um, a couple of two shows that we did um, because there was supposed to be a uh, we, there was supposed to be a TV show about about we were going we could be an episode we were going to be an episode of a TV show which didn't happen. So we there was no incentive for the band to continue. They all said no, no, we don't want to carry on with this. You know, no, no. no. So um, you know, I, I had babies, and eventually I started um, re, re linking up psychedelia and my love of 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 the psychedelicness of of things and and acoustic music, and 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 started creating my version of acid folk. Yes, which we which we love a bit of acid folk. I mean, it has that kind of some of the roots. God knows where, exactly where the roots, but I know that there was a lot of the the travelling convoy people in the eighties. Oh, yeah, sort yeah, of like yeah, to, the convoy, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the peace convoy, <laughs> which was quite ironic considering it wasn't very peaceful. I mean, yeah. did that with that that eighties period? Obviously, you, you know that that must have been a little bit of a strange time, sort of having sort of gone from the city into the country and then suddenly realizing the police where that became this kind of mega band did that was that kind of uh, not you know considering you've been sort of working away in entertainment with hair and then with curved air 
from the sort of the 60s, then having another decade where suddenly the police were this kind of mega band. Was that quite odd or quite strange to deal with it, you know, being seen? Well, it was beautiful. It was amazing. You know, there were these young gods, you know, and I think I think that, you know, pop rock stars in particular, I mean, or whatever, these, these people who have all this adulation, you know, in that they are heroes or gods in the eyes of their fans you know they people ad, ad, they, they worship them if you like and so there were these three golden haired even though it came out of a bottle gold with the gold hair but they <laughs> they um you know they were started off playing to two men and a dog in a in the little pubs little pubs and you know no nobody there and the punks sort of say well this isn't punk you know they, they as they played played their songs and and um they weren't getting anywhere then they then they went to um america and played little dives over there and then which ian stewart's other brother i mean that because that was incredible these three brothers you know it's like something out of a out of a fairy story you know they 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 create this the new way world of the of of the post new wave world, and um, and so Ian was the 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 agent for 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 most most with mo most of the bands and Mars's bands and other big bands REM and people, but um, so uh, th th this just just to watch this when they came back from America. And then Roxanne became a hit, you know. So the same little songs that they used to play in the in the clubs where nobody was interested, and people used to hate the strings voice. Oh, I don't like his voice, you know. It's just kind of this sort of high squeak, squeak, squeaky thing. And um, well, but it's not squeaky. I mean, it, but it, but people, it wasn't to everybody's taste. Yes. And then and then they'd be playing like the Lyceum, and you know, which a packed Lyceum, and everybody would be singing along singing along to this these these songs you know and and and, and the, the band with decent amplification you know not not the sort of kind of amplification that they went out within the little clubs little but little pubs and pubs really yeah um music music new small music venues you know they, they and you know they they just the andy summers guitar sounded like an orchestra you know, and, and the whole thing was, the sound was just beautiful. And it was really, really extraordinary. And um, the, uh, and then, you know, going, going abroad and I went to Japan with them and, and, and we, they were, they were, I just, you know, they used to take the wives out now and again, the rest of the time they were being boys on the road, but they had, you know, they, we went out all together. So we used to sit in the dressing room, us three wives. And um, and I remember being a bit antsy, you know, hearing the the audience going, you know, the the, the roar of the amphitheatre, you know, the of the festival, huge audience. Is and thinking, oh, I want to be out there. You know, this it wasn't it, my, my desire to perform was was still there. Yes. And so and so when my kids were were um, when the youngest was 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 coming up to three that. Well, I, I started um, writing songs again because there was this new new thing that was happening, this new acoustic movement, or what became the music move, new acoustic movement. People started writing about it, which this guy Roddy Harris was doing at the Troubadour, which where I'd, I'd used to go when I was back in 1968. But it's all my my life has been full of magical magical coincidences and and you know just you know, so wow you know that that's like like when i when i split up with my husband um before the 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 live reunion gig and after between between um the end of um aircut and the live reunion gig you know i was i went to a, a performance of the rocky horror show and i met this woman and um you know i heard this these peace and bliss and whatever these hippie words coming across the party and 
And so I got into conversation with her. And then I said, oh, my, my, my relationship just split this up. I don't want to go back home ever again or whatever. And so she said, oh, you come and stay with me. And so I, I, we, we got a cab back. And I said, where do, you, where do you live? And she said, oh, in Hampstead. And she said, I said, where? Reddington Road. And I said, just jokingly, I said, not 87. And she said, uh, yeah. I said, not the penthouse. She said, yes, you know. And so this was the same place where Curb Dare had, had lived, the same flat that Curb Dare had lived for the four, four, for the first three years, uh, you know, once we got, uh, got our set together. So that's where we left from and went, went off on, on uh, you know, on our adventures around England and, and, and Europe. And before that, the reason we, we would got on there, I think, is because various members of the hair and hair cast, Elaine Page and and people had been had lived in there, and they vacated and we moved in there. And um, when I was living with Norma, um, Ian Stewart's brother was living in the flat down down below, and that was where I first met Stuart. And so Stuart and I got together whilst I was living with Norma there, and. Um, you know, so which which you know that all all that is you know it's like the 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 stuff of of fantasy really. I mean, it, but it's magic magical, but it's true. Yes, well, it's slightly magical fantasy. It's incredible, actually, to sort of. And then, obviously, you were just, you just a bit earlier. You'd said that it was two thousand and eight. The band kind of reformed again, and obviously, have still on the road, even though there's been like like a shuffled pack of cards so quite a few changes what was the kind of what what was the reason for sort of reforming the band in 2008 was there a a phone call or a funeral one or the other they often one or the other um, well, well well for for a few years daryl had been sort of contacting me and saying oh let, let's let's get the band together again but it wasn't right because i was busy for for um 12 years i was working with and and sort of romantically involved with this wonderful um cello player who was a big thing in ambient music right. and uh and of course it called marvin Ayres. and um so and we we recorded two two albums together and by the you know by the time when once we'd done the 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 second album there's, there's the, the technopia where i think i think it was obvious that we weren't going to you know the things we you know, we, we, we 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 were still um we were still together as 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 friends and um but we'd finished the i kept on saying i can't do it because i'm recording all my all my creator energy energy is going into this this um this project and so after when well, once we'd finished the foot the the second album technopia then i said okay right let's we can, we can go for it then I'm, I'm up for it i'm free now you know we can i can let's 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 see what happens with curved air and then francis didn't want to want to join and and uh florian did and so we one of our first main gigs was the isle of white festival and that was lovely there's a nice video of that which my son did, who's my, who is, who 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 does, he, his thing is working in with video, videos and things, and and um, so you know we 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 went on. Um, what, what happened? Have we? We did that 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 lineup. Um, we, we we got a guitarist, and then we changed who who. But when we had when we were going to go to Japan, he couldn't fly, so then we changed guitarist. We put a new guitarist in called Kit Morgan, who was who was brilliant. Learned it all. He did one rehearsal with us before we went to Japan, and then he was there on stage, and that's all been documented on video. And that the 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 the, the curved air that went to Japan. And so you know we we were traveling, and when we first started off. You know, the, things had changed so much in the music business yes. that we couldn't find anybody in the music papers who even knew who Curved Air were. You know, Curved Air, Curved Air. You know, it's sort of kind of at that at that at that point in time. So it was very difficult to get, or even in the local local papers. You know, there was there were Curved Air fans out there, but they weren't in positions of influence. So, you know, we we carried on, and then. Um, 
we went um, to we our, our our agent said that there was this guy um, Martin. I can't remember another Russian. The what well, there there was this guy QEDG with this the the um, the 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 management company right and who who might be interested in in managing us so i can't forget his name and it's it's so 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 it's important because he's an important person in my life oh that's just an age thing right so it'll it'll come back it'll but, be there. Um, <laughs> but um so he took us on we were we went for a meeting up with with, with um um, in in he, he out, out in the countryside he has he had a a big had had a sort of farm come estate thing there <clears throat> and so he started that there his his QEDG started managing us and then we started doing joint bills with Martin Turner's Wishbone Ash and 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 things and oh yeah Daryl left there was I forgot there was no those we um. After we'd done a certain amount of, of, of dates with Daryl, you know, from, from 2008, so it was only a year. So in 2009, Daryl was having nervous breakdowns from traveling. And so he didn't want to, he, he, he couldn't go on, be on the road anymore. So then I got in, um, for, no, for, first we got Eddie over, Eddie, Eddie Jobson. And he did one little show with us, but it was very expensive <clears throat> for us because um, he had to bring his, um, you know, special equipment and and his sound engineer and, and everything. But we did one little show and, at, at uh, which is legendary with with Eddie Jobson. And then I brought in um, my key, keyboard player and violinist from the Acid Boat days, who I had. Um, uh, who, who, who I had, had had found by various synchronicities, and you know Ro Robert had come to my house selling organic vegetables, oh, nice. and and somebody happened to mention he played lovely, lovely keyboards, and so one day I had, I had this little honky tonk piano that used to belong to Miles Senior. And uh, I said, oh, you know, I hear you play really, play, you play keyboards. I said, do you want to play something for me? So we sat down, this magical stuff, you know, he played so beautifully. And um, Paul Sachs, first of all, I was playing with um, a, first of all, I, I asked this <clears throat> handsome young violinist who'd been playing with, um, in a, in a, as a quartet, playing in a quartet, a piece of music that Daryl had written, you know, and I'd seen seen him, and, and I, I said, "Oh, he would be good because he's young," and, and so I took him down to these these kind of acoustic, new acoustic gigs at, at the at the Troubadour where I was hanging out and getting to know people and things. And so, but then he left to join the main Roddy Roddy's band, the main band Miro. Oh, right. and so then. A, a, an actor I was also doing plays going, going back to acting as well and this an actor from the play I was in called Shona the play the play called Shona he said oh I've just seen a, an amazing violinist busking in 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 um in, in some, some marketplace or whatever and I took his phone number for my because I wanted him to play at my daughter's wedding so I called him up and that was Paul Sachs so he he and he was absolutely totally magically you know almost like like sort of Robin Robin Williamson-esque of the violin right. you know he 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 played you know his his melodies came from everywhere you know he he was so, so he just he didn't it didn't sound like a violinist in a band or like an electric guitarist. You know, he, he just he just played the songs and I would give sort of cues like make this really fiery and my, my, my ways of, of, get, of, of telling people what to play, you know, like this, this like raindrops and this really fiery and you know, this, this is a, you know, like 
like a lullaby, you know, little bits of things. So, so I brought them in anyway. I brought them into curved air, and so they carried on. Um, uh, Paul Sachs left um, because he had a, a sort of a, he was in a, he was playing was causing a lot of pain. He had problems with his spine from 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 doing lots of two hour sets with us, and then. Um, and Robert is still, still with us, you know. And he, Robert's been with us since two thousand and nine. And Chris, who is, um, he, 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 he was working with Daryl, and Daryl brought him in for the, our first, very first gigs, Isle of Wight and uh, onwards. So he's been with us for since two thousand and eight. Um, and then Florian. Had to, who was who was with who was with Curved Air? He he wasn't well. He couldn't stand. He couldn't. Um, he didn't wasn't strong enough to tour anymore. So then I brought in my drummer from Acid Folk days, Andy Tween, who in between, you know, he he was there. He was in when he was twenty one when he first joined us. He was straight out of music college, and you know, just trying to learn my weird little rhythms and things that I want them to play sort of bars of six and then eight and then whatever different whatever whether they were whatever they were you know and he was concentrating trying very hard but he was really really good percussionist yeah. so he'd been he's been playing all all manner of work since uh, the um since the 90s um he you know and so he, he was he was ready to come back and join us so he now is a very very kind of main part of the band because um you know we're we're, we're trying to re we're recording a we're trying to write a new album together with this lineup the, the the lineup with paul paul and robert we recorded north star which was the first new curved air album that had been recorded since aircut i think yes but the others the others had all been live albums so and that and that was very successful in terms of of um, of sales from our and also another thing that had happened since two thousand and eight, when nobody knew, you know, who Curved Air was and prog still was unfashionable. The um, this this friend of of Martin's, um, the, 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 his surname is flying through my brain, but not stopping. The the um, he. he 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 started the big glossy prog magazine. You know, he'd already done yes. the the, yes. the 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 rock the heavy rock rock magazine. So prog and there were there was some there were prog festivals and there are young prog bands and you know so prog is now you know an acceptable genre again a way of exploring exploring what can be done yes. with the yes. music yes. with the piece people you know. Yeah, well, in the old days, it was just kind of people just always thought of top topographic oceans and genesis and then thought, oh, my God, that's a bit overblown. But now I think it's it's kind of past that hedonistic kind of 70s phase of prog. So, I mean, so with the band, you mentioned you've got the Patreon and you've got your um, new album coming out and you've got a tour as well, which is hopefully going to happen next year, which is very exciting. And um, I was just kind of it's always kind of curious. I mean, <clears throat> if you were. God, you're even going to Brazil in March. This is very exciting, isn't it? Brazil. Just get your visa sorted. I mean, if you were able to say something to your, say, 16-year or 18-year-old self, you know, just a, a couple of words of wisdom that um, you might just thought, oh, yes, I would have told them to either keep doing that or just to, to keep your eye on can this. I add an, can I add an afterthought to Brazil? Yes. Tell us. Yes. Our problem is um at this stage there is covid and we have one ardent robert um my magical keyboard player he's an ardent anti-vaxxer so he won't be vaccinated and our bass player our long long lasting bass player he um he's allergic to vaccines he had a terrible reaction to a vaccine not not that long ago and he doesn't want to go there again so we are we are having to we, we, we still want to go to brazil and we're still um you know we have a deal with the promoter over there so we're still um sounding out 
different possibilities for depth keyboard and bass players who will play with us whenever this situation arrives when one has to cross a border and go through you know and have to have have uh, whatever covid yeah. tests and be multi-vaccinated I, I think, I think it's probably a good yeah. idea to have a backup on the if, you know just in case because i think there's a certain age that if you get covid it's probably not going to be good is it so um plan forward planning so just briefly on the brazil bit then do you have a do you have quite a fan base in brazil i mean you know we, we do we do the um it's a double bill with renaissance and it, it was supposed to happen back in in 2020 but that was before covid it was booked booked so um yeah no we, we we're constantly getting getting messages saying that they've they put their tickets and they've got photographs of their tickets and and everything so we we want to get over there and play and play for them and we've our, our one of the ideas on the table is to get a brazilian some brazilian depths so we go over there and then we pick up pick up um some you know some temporary curved air members from brazilian you know really good pro professional session players and and this and i just thought well this is maybe this is something we could do we, we, maybe we could do that in italy in france and anywhere else you know we could just get the, the, it's like 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 james brown's band you know sort of this sort of, who, who, he didn't he used to pick up a, a band in in different band in every city yeah, I think so. And also, I know there's been a few people who've re or either reformed or they wanted to reform but were missing a member. Then they realised there was a tribute band out there and went, oh, let's go and find the, the guitarist or the bass player or the singer of the tribute band because they'll be fine. Dunk. And that was like, oh, that yeah. was simple. But we don't have any tribute bands yet. I know. Sharks, that's so close. But it's a great <laughs> idea. I love. I think that was in it in excess you know obviously when their lead singer died they thought well that's definitely the end of it and then they would, probably were tapping their toes thinking this is a bit boring what should we do next and it's like we'll get back but there's a problem it's like oh look there is a tribute band we'll just get that singer and put them in and let's let's just let's go let's not worry let's not think about it you can overthink these things it's just too much but yeah so so yes brazil it's fingers crossed on that front i know um but at least you've got the dates in the uk in march so yeah the the if you you know with the the, the experience and decades i just wondered if there was kind of a few kind of mo you know just a few bullet points words of wisdom that you said yeah i would have just whispered that in their ear as they launched into their kind of life and creative life what do we, what you want do you want me to say say some useful statements for yeah no i just wondered if you could have said something to your 16 year old self starting out you know just roughly you know without you know i, I just wondered if there would have been something you'd have just whispered to them as they were just wandering down the corridor or you were just going into you know pass them by and just said oh yeah by the way you know i just wondered if there was any any kind of thing that you would have done you know like just that word of wisdom or words of wisdom that you would have just said in you know i you know some people say i would have just said don't drink so much or just try and enjoy yourself or practice a bit more i mean there's always i mean they're always a bit like that but i'm just always kind of curious because sometimes people say things that are like they've, they've obviously thought about it quite a bit and i just wondered if you'd also had a something you would have just wanted to have told yourself starting out no I think that my life has turned out just as it should have done, even though I've ha I've been I've had times of being absolutely broke, and times of you know like with Stuart when we had when we were very very wealthy yes. and could have all the toys and things, and um, so and times when 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 we were when when curved air were winning awards and and you know but the, we just you know we were just had, having and having to, to keep the band going you know we, it was just I, th I i think i would just say like to anybody who's following in my in my footsteps is to trust trust your instincts and don't lose faith just because the you know that the it seems that everything else has stopped you know just it, to me it, it's like waiting for a bus you know yes. you wait for a bus and nothing's you know your your bus doesn't stop but then your bus stops so then you jump on 
and so your journey can continues and in the meantime you've got to earn a living you've got to do whatever you know that but that doesn't mean to say that your music career is over and and um so you know you, you just take the next opportunity that there is to to continue with whatever it is you do artistically for me it's you know both acting and and being a rock singer and being you know doing these things but it's yeah it's just to 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 not to lose faith and to keep going and and um trust because i find that when you know when when the when there's when the, then there's a feeling that there's no energy around that's when the the synchronous synchronicities don't don't happen you know that it feels very dead and quiet but once the energy starts building that's when you know there's there's a kind of of um magic in the air literally and things just start to happen you go you're in the right place at the right time you know i went to to audition for hair at just at the right time you know i left dropped out of college at just the right time you know they my my manager went my, the manager of curved curved dare uh, went to my my manager at just the right time we we had a hit record you know i mean my my life has been so lucky you know and yet i've never really had you know the even now, you know, I don't have security. I'm in a rented flat. Um, I spent a lot of money on 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 keeping keeping mask. We, we both both did, you know, on keeping mask going and 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 on keeping curved air going. You know, just when when there were bills that needed to be paid when before the records came out and things like that. And and so I've invested in myself. It went the money that I have had. So now, you know, so now it's. You know, it's clean slate time, but yeah. I think there's a lot of potential, potential there. You know, we've built up you now from from being a band that everybody had forgotten about. You know, I, I mean, I've won won an award from Prog, my Prog magazine. I'm, I'm a guy, guiding light, apparently, and uh, yes, it's you know, nice. and and that was wonderful when I stood on the stage to to. You know, I've not not done anything like that. I've never. Well, I mean, I have had did have an award in, in 1971 as well, but you know, this time I had to give a speech, and so there I was. There was like Peter Gabriel in the audience, and all these people, all these people who who I who I love. Peter Gabriel, I think, is he's he's a hero of mine too. Yes. You know, he he is he is somebody whose music music I will always love, and um, you know, I just had to speak. To these, to these people, to these gods, you know, in my, in my, in my, in my, um, in my, in, in my universe, they're gods, and so I had to talk to these gods to say, to say, to accept my guiding light and award, yes. and um, you know, so, so, so we we have achieved, you know, I, I feel that that whatever we, we that we will keep going and that we do have an audience and you know through patreon and and things you know i'll become i'll get to know people better because of the nature of patreon is is real a real community building you know and and of course i mean our original audience is getting older and things so you know we we but the, now there are i mean there's one one girl um uh who, who's 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 big in the in the in the new 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 prog prog uh, new new progressive things? Um, what what, what what's just, uh, her name is disappearing? I must be getting tired. This is why my 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 memory things are on, running slow. But anyway, she came she came to she was in a band called Person Rosie. Um, she she she. Um, she and her band came to see Curved Air play in, in when we played South End, and she has based her whole persona on on my persona in in when we did um, Beat Club videos. Yeah. And so, so and and so she 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 was like staring at me whilst I was signing. We were at the merch desk, and then we got talking, and and you know she's 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 very powerful. Um, performer but you know but she's you know there is a, now that there are young people out there who who make pro progressive 
rock music, some of some of which is in the image of bands that have come before, and some of which is is their own thing. Particularly in Europe, you know, they've got some very very adventurous um, new new bands that 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 sort of play prog festivals. So they're they're progressive, and so you know, that, I think that we 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 are here to stay now. Oh God, yes, absolutely. Well, look, Sonia, this has been amazing. So I'll let I'll let you go because um yes, I don't want, it's, I don't want you to get exhausted. But thank you ever so much for the time for this. It's been amazing. If you want, when I've done it, I can send you the link as well, and then you could put it on your Facebook page or or your um, social media or website. Who knows? I mean, it's all good stuff. Yeah. So and it's always you know people love to hear a story, don't they? Let's face it. So um, but yes, thank you so much. And, and how long is how long, how long, how long will it be? Well, well, I'll probably keep most of it because it's kind of, it kind of works as a narrative, actually. <laughs> so like, it's often hard to sort of go, oh, that's bit and that, you know, so actually, I think um, it's a good oversight of, of one's amazing career, which is fantastic. And, you know, people, people do love listening to interviews now, which is quite interesting. So, um, which I'll find. Podcasts, so, isn't it? Because whilst you're doing other things in your, in your, your little space capsule that you live in that we don't go out of much you know you can listen to things whilst you're walking around doing things this is what podcast. people love yes this is, this is yeah. great but i'll also put it on our radio channel as well so i'll tell you when it goes out and um look best of luck with you know all the projects for 2022 my god that seems so weird um but yeah thanks again for your time and look have a lovely evening and um yes thanks for agreeing for this this has been brilliant is all right yeah, I mean, I enjoyed it. Thank you very much, David. Yeah, sorry, yeah. I was trying to find my mouse there. Well, you know, this thing, um, not not a not a furry mouse. Anyway, look, take care and have a lovely evening. And um, I will check out the Velvet Underground film, and um, and one day yeah, I'll. No, no, no. what? It's rude. Yeah, I need to subscribe to the Disney Channel for one month and watch the um, the Beatles film over the course of Christmas I think in two hour chunks it's probably very long isn't it it's eight hours so um anyway Todd really? Haynes I don't know about that one but I mean I love John Lennon John Lennon is one of my heroes yes well well Peter Jackson who did the um Lord of the Rings has got this eight hour film so um but I think you can watch it in small chunks but apparently it's brilliant and people have really enjoyed it so um the Beatles let it be there's some interesting bits, apparently. But look, look, I'll let you go. But thanks again and take care. Life is magical. Okay. It is, it is magical. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. Bye. And that was me in conversation with Sonia and Christina finding out more about life, love, poetry and all that other groovy stuff. This has been The C86 Show. I'm David Easter. If you want to contact me, you can on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Just do C86 Show. Also, all these have been archived. Lucky you. And uh, you can find those on, um, just do C86 on Spotify, iTunes and Podbean, indeed. Anyway, look, have a great week and stay safe. <laughs>